You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Claret and Blue podcast. We've lined up another former Villa hero for you, Mr Stephen Froggett. How are you, Froggy? I'm great, thanks. You, Matt? Yeah, it's really, really good to see you. I know that you're going to, uh, no, no pressure. But I know that you're going to kind of regard us with with plenty of uh, plenty of interesting, amusing stories from your from your time at Villa. Uh, before we get to Villa, I want to roll back to when you were a very very small little boy. Um, was it always football for you, Froggy? From the from the moment that you could walk? I mean, it was really. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on a quite a poor council estate in Lincoln. Um, started. You know, I remember having a, my first leather football from the age of five, six. I remember that much. I used to spend hours outside on my own doing kickups, and I think by the time I was eleven years of age, I remember my, I broke my best record I can remember, and I got bored of doing it. I did ten thousand um, non-stop kickups without dropping the ball. Then I got bored of that game, and I went on to something else. So, yeah, fo- football. My dad was a, a huge football fan. He he played football, but had to. He had to quit because back in those days, if you had a cartilage injury, it was it was the end of your career. So, um, yeah, it was it was something I loved from a very early age and played as a nine year old in a, an under fourteen side, which was fantastic. Because actually, the goalkeeper in that side side was a, a lad called Marlon Beresford, who went on to be a keeper for Burnley amongst others. Um, yeah, and, and and that was a real test for me playing against under you know under fourteen lads as a nine year old. Um, you know, I was always skinny anyway. Definitely, I was back in those days. So I, I took a, quite a kick in even back in those days. But it taught me how to to handle myself and look after myself amongst bigger, more physical players. I couldn't even count to ten thousand, let alone do do ten thousand keep you up. If I remember rightly, it probably took me. I think I took about six or seven hours, which is why you can understand I got really bored with that game, and I thought I need to try something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, in terms of turning what was clearly a pas- passion and a hobby into thinking I'm half decent at this I could make a career out of it what what was the the next step well it was difficult I mean obviously Lincoln Shear as such was not not a, a real backwater for for you know scouts and bringing footballers um so I got recognized in a, a county game and I got invited to go and pl- uh, go to Mansfield with a lad called Jonathan Kerrigan who was the sweeper in my team and that's a Jonathan Kerrigan from Heartbeat fame, famous actor. Okay. And, and we both we both went to Mansfield. We both were offered schoolboy forms. Um, and then as I, I was just about to sign for Mansfield and somebody called Dave Richardson um, gave me a call. He was at Leicester City at the time. So Johnny signed for uh, Mansfield and obviously went on to bigger and better things, I guess, with, the, with his acting career. And I went to Leicester. And actually, I was only at Leicester for about eight or nine months. And then Dave Richardson was uh, poached by Graham Taylor and Aston Villa, if I remember rightly. And Graham, uh, Dave said, if I wanted to join him, Aston Villa, and obviously absolutely fantastic. It was a, a dream situation. Villa were, were a huge club. Obviously, I knew all about the history and, and the players at the time. So, yeah, I mean, it was just a, a fantastic thing for me to come down as a you know a council estate kid from Lincoln to to train with some of these amazing players. So what what age was it when you you kind of moved from Leicester to, to Villa? Sorry, it was just before my fourteenth birthday. So I signed Associated Schoolboy forms when I was fourteen, um, and then I came down every summer. I used to stay with uh, obviously people who know Villa were know Jim and Sylvie Paul. They had their hostel, so I, I, I came down in the uh half terms april uh, easter holidays summer holidays for weeks on end and stayed with jim and Silv in their hostel and then when i was 16 uh, i was offered an apprenticeship and i moved down with the tyrrells which were a brilliant family they were they were an irish family and ian was an apprentice for me at aston villa so it was brilliant and i had, you know, I had so much fun it was great because they you know the the, the, the house had a real sense of humor which i i kind of really really enjoyed being part of there was two uh, two sisters there that actually was hilarious to me because I had a younger brother, knew nothing about women, but living with them for four years, I learned plenty about how <laughs> to treat and how to be around women. I learned everything in those four years, let me tell you. So uh, it was it was a great environment to to sort of grow up, uh, uh, you know, as, as a young person coming from a, another town. I, did, I don't know, I did, I did get homesick because I was a real homeboy. I, I missed all my friends, obviously. You know, because I had to say goodbye to them. Le- you know, leaving home as a six-year-old boy when I look now. I mean, my lad's 23 years of age and still living at home. 
And, and I look and go, wow, you know, that, that's quite a big ask for a young kid to just move, give up his life and, and move to another city. Who would have been in the academy with you back then? Oh, we had, I mean, our, our academy team. So, for instance, in, in the, so when I came in as the first year, um, the second year lads were the likes of Tommy Mooney, um, Martin Carruthers, I mean, there's some really, really, I mean, there's some really, really good lads who went, who actually went on to, I mean, they had decent lower league careers. Craig Little, he he went on and played a, a decent level. So we had, we had loads of really good lads in and around the side that that went on to play football at a good level. And you know, we we, we did quite well in the FA Youth Cup. I remember, I think we I think we won won one of the leagues, the Midland Leagues, one year. But it it was really competitive. There were really you know good, funny, powerful set of boys. And, and, and again, I learned so much in that first year of being an apprentice. Um, not all good, I dare say. Um, one of my great friends in football, God rest his soul, was Paul Birch. Um, I had the great pleasure of playing with him at Villa and obviously at, at, at Wolves as well. But he was one of my closest friends in the game and um, I was his boot boy. And when I had to address him, now bear in mind, back, back then, he wasn't all bald. He, he had long, glowing, you know, curly blonde locks. And I had to knock on the first team door and I had to go get on my hands and knees and bow down and go, blonde bombshell, please may I clean your boots. And if I didn't say that, I literally got a right good kick in and got chased around the training ground by, by Platy, Alan McAnally. I remember once being thrown headfirst into a dustbin because I didn't do his boots. <laughs> I think I might have told him where to stick his boots. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, you look back now and you think, the, the, the wokes of today would be claiming bullying and, and all that sort of stuff. But for me, it, it was it was a rite of passage. I was a quiet kid. And there was no way I'd have made a career in, in professional football if I'd, have, if I'd have stayed the person I was without developing that sort of, OK, that mentality, you, you're around men now. You can't you can't be a child anymore. This is a man's game. Um, so, yeah, there, there was all sorts of things that went on. It, it, they, they were terrible, really, but funny. What were your first impressions like of, of, of Graham Taylor, Froggy? Me and Graham Taylor got on famously he was from my neck of the woods his his father was a reporter in scunthorpe he'd managed the team that me and my dad used to go to the terraces to watch not only that but two of his coaches ended up being coaches at villa dennis booth and john ward so my my childhood heroes from the terraces weren't, weren't actually any of the the top flight players they, they were the lads who, who were my coaches at aston villa um so for me it was just a, a surreal experience and 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 Graham always, he actually really looked after me because I think he had, I was the only person at the football club from Lincolnshire. And he, he, he obviously had some sort of affinity with me, but he got the England job before um, I, I was anywhere near the first team. So it was actually big Ron uh, when he came in. And I, I remember I was playing in the reserve team and we played, we actually played into Milan at home and I was flying and I played against one of their, one of their top right backs. And I gave him a right good going over. And I kind of sensed I can't be far away from a first team call up here because I'm playing that well at, at, at youth level. But I realised I was about nine stone wet through. And when I saw, you know, the, the, the men that, that was going to be up against, it was always going to be a big ass for me because of the physicality side of it. But it was only a few months later and it was... Yeah, Again, this is 30 years ago. That picture you put of me the other day, by the way, that's 30 years old. That really, thanks for making me feel really old, by the way. Um, <laughs> and and big run, it was a Boxing Day game against West Ham. So we stayed in the hotel Saturday night and he told me I was going to be on the bench the next day. So you imagine, I'm like, I, was, I was just turned 18, I think. It was like, a, it was just an amazing feeling. Think, oh, great, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be involved with the first team, lads. And, and my, my only memory of my debut, I don't think I, I came on for about eight minutes. I don't think I kicked a ball, but I think I ran about eight miles. So I was running around like a like a Taz of Tasmania. I didn't get involved in the game, but but it was just such a, a huge buzz actually just being involved in the first team. I know you've got a brilliant story about the first time you played for Aston Villa first team, not competitively, <laughs> but in a in a testimonial, I believe. Oh, the Kenny Dalglish story. Oh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so, yeah, we, we, we went to Hibernian, Easter Road. And, I mean, Kenny was an icon. It, 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 it retired, obviously, long since then, but he was playing for Hibernian. So I'm playing against him in the middle of the park. And I, he, wasn't, he wasn't happy with me because I, I just kept running past him all the time. And he was, he, he started, he, he, at the beginning, he started to try kicking me. That didn't work. 
And then he's, he's rugby tackled me as a joke in the middle of the pitch. And as he's done that, he's ripped my pants, jock strap, everything down. So I'm sort of stark as in the centre circle with Kenny sprawled across the pitch with my jock strap in his hands. And to this day, I actually, I don't, I don't know if it's rude, but I, to this day, I believe the jock strap is still actually framed in, in the hallways of Easter Road, where obviously it's nothing to do with me. It was the fact that Kenny did it, and it was a picture with Kenny. So I still believe it's still there. You've made the, the breakthrough under Ron. We've asked you about Graham, and we know that kind of Graham was the one who set you on the path to, to professional football. And you, you know, yeah. later, later you, you continue to have a great relationship with him. What was what was it like kind of being part of that kind of swaggering early 1990s kind of Ron Atkinson squad? Well, it was awesome. I mean, and again, the, another story, this is coming out of the, the West Ham game. I mean, I, I said I was I was a poor kid from didn't have any money. I was on £22 a week as a YTS. I had the worst tweed jacket known to man. It was the only one I had. I had one pair of trousers to my name. And when I came back in, I went in for a shower. When I've come back in, I've put my jacket on and I've realised someone had cut the sleeves off my jacket. Not only that, they turned my trousers into a pair of shorts. So I'm thinking, oh no, this is a nightmare because I, I think we had a game on the Tuesday and I couldn't afford it. No way could I afford to buy a, um, a suit. I didn't have any money. So I'm, I'm pretting a bit. So anyway, I thought I'm not going to let them show up. They've got to me because I, I'd had the experience with Birchie and how to deal with it all. So I see you on Monday, lads. So sleeveless jacket so i've walked into the car park and the fan whoever was there watching must have gone what is he wearing sleeveless jacket shorts as trousers so monday morning gone into my uh onto my peg and i've noticed there was a suit carrier on there so to cut a long story short the first team had whip we had a whip round and bought me a suit and and some shoes because they know i couldn't afford it and knew i didn't have, i didn't have a nice suit anyway and the only reason they did it is because i didn't sort like a baby i took it like a man and that, and that, again, it's a lesson learned. It was a valuable lesson I learned very early on that when you're playing with, you know, especially top players as they were, just get on with it. For, for a young kid to kind of almost go in and hold his own in terms of the banter, in, ter in terms of the football ability, that, that must have been a real kind of, you know, it's stating the obvious, but it must have been a real kind of confidence boost that, that, that those times for you. When I look back now, Matt, it was quite scary because I'd always kept my feet on the ground. I was, ne I never went down the arrogant. I was always, a, you know, me, you know, know me for a long time. You know what sort of person I am. Um, and I was, a, you know, a quiet, I was quiet. I sort of hid away from the limelight, didn't really enjoy any of it. But in the space of, I think, about a month, I'd, it might have been two weeks later, actually, I made my de full debut at Highbury against Lee Dixon. The following week, if I remember rightly, we played Everton at home on a live televised game and I got man of the match. The following weekend, I got the goal against Swindon. The following week, I got called up by the England under 21. So in literally in the space of a month, I'd gone from this scrawny Lincoln lad to not being able to kind of walk down the streets with without a lot of people starting to recognize who you were and that was i found that really scary because it it wasn't like a gradual thing it was just bang overnight and then you were you're then all of a sudden the you're then under pressure to to be part and to deliver and as an 18 year old boy that that's quite frightening especially when you're playing in a team of international superstars who've who you know who are long in the tooth who, who've gone through so much as players themselves and there's is this little 18 year old nine stone wet through trying trying to find his way amongst it all what was it like, you know, the lifestyle? Were you out out drinking in Liberties on a on a Saturday night, or what? What kind of what well, was the vibe like with that? On twenty two quid a week. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I used to trundle into I used to trundle into the car park in a little Fiesta nine fifty fifty plus, and I remember the day that when Dean Saunders drive because Big Ron was fuming because Dino drove in a better car than Big Ron. So Dino, Dino, Big Ron had like the three fifty SL, and, and Dino come in with the five hundred. And Big Ron came storming in and went, right, you can park that round the corner. The manager should have the best car in the, in the club. So I never got involved in that because I couldn't really, my, my 2250 couldn't really stretch that far. So for me, I'm sure at the time, because we were, we were, you know, obviously when Dino came and we were flying and we were top of the league and all that was going on, our win bonuses were like a thousand pound a game. So you can imagine me. £22 a week, £1,000 a win. I, I thought I'd won the lottery every time we won a game. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, again, you know, we, I didn't have a, you know, 
we didn't have a lot as as, a, as kids, so money was never a, a defining factor to me any way through my career for monastery. Um, but obviously, you know, it was nice to have that money as and when it came. But even when Dino came, I mean, the stories with him. Again, I'm on I'm on twenty two quid a week. I probably was on no actually I, I, at that time I think I'd been I'd, I'd actually signed my first pro contract, so I think I was on about I think I was on one hundred and seventy quid a week. And Dino introduced me to his wife because from the moment Dino arrived from Liverpool, I made him goal after goal after goal after goal. Mm -hmm. Literally mm -hmm. every week I was putting on the plate for it. So we've gone into the players' bar this one one night and he's introduced me to his wife as the person who just made them their second million. <laughs> and I'm 150 quid a week. I'm going, yeah, cheers, Dino. That's, that's really good, thanks. <laughs> I hope he got you a beer in. <laughs> he did, yeah. I mean, they, they were, you know, they were funny lads. I mean, they were. You, when I look back, you look back at the end of a career, and I'm, you know, I'm 48 now, and, and you, you, I look so fondly back on those days because that was just an incredible to play in that side as a, as a young boy as well in that amazing team where Big Ron just let us go and play. He just when I when all, all Ron said to me at the start of every game, and, and what he used to do is to, to calm my nerves down. He used to give me a nip of Courvoisier before every game just a little just a little nip just to take the edge off a little bit and um and he, all he said to me was entertain me and i remember because he big ron's big thing was me getting chalk on on my boots he wanted because obviously he had ray howard who'd come in all the time if, if he went if, if i came in all the time we'd be too narrow so he wanted me to to get chalk on my boots and give the team some width and, and it really helped because there was lots of space for the lads to come play through the middle of the park so whenever the ball came to me Ron used to slaughter me if I didn't attack the defender but on the outside. Mm -hmm. And he went, if you fail, you do it again. I remember one game I'm trying to take, it was, I was a top, playing against a top right back and I was on my fifth time and I couldn't get past him. And, and still Ron was there screaming encouragement. Again, anyway, sixth time I got in, crossed the ball, Dino scored. And, and it, it <clears> taught me a lesson about being brave. You know, you, I see too many wingers nowadays take the easy option oh let's pass it backwards let's pass it inside let's let oh I, I don't want to attack the fullback but big big ron that was a huge thing he did with me was like to give me the confidence and the belief and and big ron was no master ta tactician don't get me wrong he wasn't he wasn't a a, a, a coach as such as, as i had in some other but he was he was the most amazing man manager who could make you feel 10 foot tall whenever you went out on the pitch did big ron put you on a guinness diet to try and get balls <laughs> up a bit I mean, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm, 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 I'm over. Let's just say I'm over 14 stone now. I was nine stone, and, and actually, you can tell. I mean, looking at that picture that you sent me, every shirt I wore, it looked like they gave me like triple extra large. Yeah, it was probably small. <laughs> so, so yeah, big one. Uh, which actually was the best thing I ever had, by the way. Bear in mind all the Irish players I went in. So I used to go down the Irish centre with like some Paul McGraw and them all the time, piling the Guinness down, me and eating steak. It was wonderful. Didn't I never put any weight on though, but it, it, it was good at the time. So you mentioned you mentioned obviously this kind of partnership that you got with with you 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 giving Dino all his goals and his fourth house or whatever you, he's got off the back of you. Do you remember? And I, I was doing some homework through one of the, the record books, and I think was it you was it your first. Premier League goal you scored against Crystal Palace. Is that right yes, or not? It was, yes. We'll, we'll get yeah. to your goal in a minute, but do you remember Ron on the pitch pitch before that game? No, no, I wouldn't. I don't think I would have done if I was in the dressing room. Well, exactly. I think he was trying to wrangle with Doug about trying to get, you know, trying to get a, a few extra quid that they needed to convince Liverpool to, to sell Dean Saunders. And Ron went on the pitch and did this kind of big speech for the microphone. I called him Dean Sanders, I think. Um, yes, he did. <laughs> but it was obviously that that game. I think beat Crystal Palace comfortably anyway. And then the next week, so I'll get you probably speak about both both the games. The next week, Dino arrived, and it was that Liverpool game, wasn't it? And I think you were involved heavily in the goals then. So what was you? I can't forgive my ignorance, Froggy. I would have been on the whole ten that day against Palace. I can't remember your goal. Can you? Yes, like like it was yesterday. Honestly, uh, I think I think it was I think it was Dino actually. No, not Dino. Sorry, it was um, might have been Ray Houghton or one, somebody else. Well, it's a midfielder. They they lobbed it into the penalty area, and it came back off the crossbar. And it and I was I was running onto the ball, and it bounced quite high. And I I kind of did an acrobatic flip and smashed it into the into the corner. 
And that was my first goal. Talk about the best feeling ever as a, as a young lad to actually score an acrobatic goal in front of the whole tent. I mean, it, it literally was the stuff that dreams are made of. It was just such an amazing thing to happen. I know it's easy to kind of lurch into kind of cliche territory when we're talking about it, but it must be like something. It's like a kind of moving mass of humanity, isn't it? Especially back then oh, when it was a standing terrace. I, I'm not ashamed to say this. Uh, Villa Park has, will and always will be my favourite football ground in any one I've been in the country. And the reason I love it so much is is the architecture, the fact it, it's one of the last remaining unique older grounds that's modernised and still looks magnificent. But but the atmosphere, I mean, the atmosphere in there. If as a player when I went on there, especially as a winger, because you, you sort of you, you can hear you can hear it crackle from the sides. And you, we'll go on to the Liverpool game, I guess, in a minute. But the the, the ground is one of my favourite places ever. So much so, I mean, I, I think you do know this, but. Um, I spread my dad's ashes on the Holt end when he passed away 20 years ago. So that's the affinity that myself and my dad had had with the football club and obviously with the ground. I didn't realise that. That's really, really, really poignant, really, really touch, touching thing that is. Just before we go on to that, that Liverpool game, can I just ask you about, when you mentioned your dad now, can I ask you about kind of what kind of influence he was in your career? I know you said when you were starting off, he was really important to you, you know, to get you to fall in love with football. But was he was he somebody who kind of follow you home and away each week, Froggy? Or yeah, he, he loved. I mean, you know, I, I was I, again hard to believe now because you know me so well. But I really lacked confidence in those days. I, I was a really unconfident kid, and I, and I took a lot of building up, and and I never believed, you know, I was good enough. Or you know, we all have self doubts in life, don't we? I guess for whatever you do in life. But my dad was always there, you know telling me you can you will you can it, there was not there was no maybes possibly it, he was so vehemently determined that I would be and he told me you'll play for England when I was 19 he said you'll, you'll, you'll play for England now any father can say that I know about the kid but the, the, the level of belief my, my dad had in me and he got involved in all my contract negotiations even though he was not an agent he, he would not let anyone off the hook if he felt they were sort of doing me a disservice in any way. And, and uh, what, what can, more can you ask of a dad? I know we're jumping all over the place a little bit. You'll have to forgive me. But in terms of that kind of, that that England nearly, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. I, I was I was 26. It's, it's funny because I, I look and I look at like the, the, the players, your Jack Grealish is today, the age they all are now. And I was a very, obviously very similar age when I got my, my, my first England call up. I was 26. And... I'd obviously done so, well enough in training that Kevin Keegan put me on the bench against Scotland at Hamden Park. So it was a double header, the European Championship double header where Scholes he scored a couple of goals uh, at Hamden Park. But at the time, my wife was pregnant with our second child, so Keegan flew me back after the game. I didn't get I didn't get off the bench on the on the Saturday. Keegan flew me home, went went with my wife. She gave birth to our second child in in Sutton Coalfield. I then got flown straight back. So I, I was literally only an hour with, with my, my new daughter. And they got flown back to, to the training camp. Anyway, that night, Kevin Keegan put on a, a meal for me and gave me, a, to, I've got it somewhere even in here, a, a big bottle of champagne to, to celebrate the birth of my daughter. And my dining partner that evening was a certain David Beckham. Which was the most surreal thing? I'm sat, I'm sat having, I'm sat talking babies with David Beckham as a 26 year old, and then on the Tuesday, I mean, at this point now, I was really drained. I mean, your first England call is quite a, it, quite a distressing thing with the, the amount of media. It again, I've never been one for media attention. I didn't seek it, um, but it happens. In, you, you've got to deal with it. But when it, it ranked up a, a ridiculous amount of notches when I got into the England squad. Um, and then Keegan on the on the on the Monday morning, he said, "Look, he said I'm not going to put you on the bench tomorrow." He said, "I was going to." He says, "But you look knackered." And it was it was absolutely right. I was I was exhausted, yeah. mentally exhausted. So we got beat by Scotland, one um, nil. Anyway, walking off the pitch, I could hear Keegan shuntering as I'm walking off behind me. He went, "I should have ignored. I should I should have gone with my gut." He said, "I was actually going to play you tonight," and I went. <laughs> Well, you know, what do you say to that? The England manager says, oh, right. oh, OK. Yeah. He says, look, I promise you, you'll play the next two games at home against Ukraine and Brazil. So I'm, I'm all primed now thinking, I'm in. I'm going to get a chance. The very next weekend, I played a Premier League game against Sunderland and that ended my career. Tackled. Done. So, so yeah, I, you can look back and go, 
I was quite lucky, really, in terms of timing. But that sums up my career. Anyone who's, who's followed my career and the tackle and the horrible tackles I had to put up with would know, yeah, that was always going to get you one day, mate. Is it right that you, you kind of dad passed around the similar time? Did he? Did he? Was he around for you to get the call up? He, oh yeah, I mean, my dad was the proudest man in the in the universe because. When they came down, they, they came down to Wembley. So obviously he was a, he was a granddad for the second time, so he was you know chuffed as punch. But he was sat next door to the likes of Rod Stewart, Caprice. My dad thought he'd made it, honestly. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, my dear, my poor wife couldn't come because she had had our daughter Leah at home. But it's a great story. So whenever my daughter eventually gets married, it's a great story to tell that the day she was born, what I was actually doing with David Beckham. Amazing. Um, <laughs> So, so it, it, it will, you know, it's a tale that, that I, I, you know, I do like to tell. It's a, it's a funny one. Uh, yeah. So, m- my dad died literally a few months after I'd lost my career. Uh, so you can imagine that, that how awful, awful that was. And, and my, my life is a, a real tale of when life kicks you down, you've got to pick yourself. But you, you have to pick yourself up. For instance, I don't know if you know this, but, but my mum died of COVID just before Christmas. So again. I've been, I've had my fair share of horrible things go on. You know, I'm, I'm one of those hundred thousand families who've, who've lost somebody, um, and it's, it was awful. You know, the, the, that I couldn't be with her when she passed because obviously I hadn't had COVID. The funeral was horrendous because there's only a few people out there. So, so yeah. Whilst you know I'm a really upbeat, positive person because you have to be. I've, I've had my fair share of, of not nice things happen over the years. Do you think your mum and dad have kind of instilled that? into you though, got to be grateful for what you've got rather than the things that you haven't got and to, like you say, deal with whatever life throws at you with a smile on your face where you can. Yeah, I, I guess I'll get, I get stopped in the street now and go, oh, you know, how, you know, do, must you feel, must feel really bad about how, what happened? And I go, well, no, I had 10 great years in, in mostly in the top flight, you know, I played at FA Cup semi-finals in cup finals, our England squad. I mean, most people, most kids only dream of doing that. I mean, why would I possibly say poor me, poor me? And I don't like, I, I hate that attitude. Oh, poor me. I, you know, I, I do see a few ex players where it's poor me, and I think, well, you know, you, you've you've li- lived the dream. There's there's more. There's I've had as much fun after football. You know, I've got a proper job. I, I you know, I'm I'm just a normal guy, and um, you know, I've had as much fun outside of football. Than I than I had when when I actually played in the game. I, I mean, I can travel whenever I want to go away now as a footballer. You can only go away for sort of three weeks in June, and that's your lot. So, in terms of you know living a life, you ha- you have to be positive. Life can drag you down and kick kick any of us at any time. And I always remain as positive as I can be. So let's take you back to I think we got to we were chatting about the the Liverpool game, and obviously yes. Dino Dino's finally arrived. Uh, Ronnie Rosenstein Charles rattled the uh, the crossbar from five yards in front of the Holt end. That was, you know, I've been I've been lucky enough to kind of live not quite the the nineteen eighty two eighty one season, but the nineties was was me growing up as a Villa as a Villa fan as a, as a teenager through then. Teenager, yeah, just about. And that that was just a really special special afternoon that that four two against Liverpool. It's actually my favourite ever game I played in. The atmosphere at Villa Park. I mean, it, it was the Villa Park was bouncing. You could hear every every little thing that went on. I mean, it obviously being Dino's debut, the, the the thing about him going playing against Liverpool and all that sort of thing, and me me setting up the first goal where where he scored the Ronnie Rosenthal miss. I remember falling over laughing with Steve Staunton with it when he missed that one. Um, and it was just an incredible game of football. The atmosphere was just off the scales, and that re- that was the first time I went, "Wow, this club is special." You know, the support, everything that that was. It. But all the fans wanted was to see an entertaining side, and and I think anybody who'd watched that team ninety two, ninety three, you could not say we were an unbelievably entertaining side. We had flair. We had you know some re- like the likes of Kevin Richardson, who was a serial winner unbelievable person to to be my captain learned so much from him big spinksy who, who i adored as well um they, they were all great steve staunton to, to play behind him I t- actually i've got another i've got a story about steve staunton that he loves telling everybody else by the way so he's used to playing with john barnes well i'm slightly different shape to barnes you know, i'm a little less rotund and you know probably not as much as ability as john barnes did if, if the truth be known so in the early days steve staunton used to hit the ball I'd be, I'd be five yards away from him like an Exocet missile. 
And it, I, I, I'll be honest, it took me a couple of t- times to actually get the ball under control. In the end, I thought, I'm going to have to be brave. I went, Stan, will you stop doing this? I said, can you not just lay it into me so I could actually on the half turn? It, and I went, you're not playing with John Barnes now, you know? And he went, don't I know it. <laughs> and he's lived, off that, he's lived off that story for 30 years, honestly. I mean, my, my son and his son are best of friends. And they, I, I, his son's been on holiday with me and my family. So you can tell the closest, even to this day. But yeah, he reminds me of that one all the time. He, lo- he does love that one. But, but he, he was brilliant as well because he'd played for Liverpool. And obviously, they were tough on their youngsters there. And what, what, they, what all them boys, they demanded. You know, they didn't let me sit, you know, and, and you know, just mess around or whatever. They were on me all the time. Steve, Steve Staunton particularly was brilliant and he was an outstanding um, left back, great left foot uh, and, and an absolute joy to play in front of. I, I, he really was. Did you think we were going to win the league that season? And how did you deal with it when it got away from us towards the, the final months? Well, we should have won. I think anybody... Any, any of us in that team, we should have won. We, we, we lost the league, in all honesty. I mean, we had we had injuries. We had things that happened. Things that we didn't all, all, almost get the rub of the green. United seemed to be falling into wins rather than playing brilliantly. And, you know, if there was a penalty, they would get it. When we got to the end of the season, we were all... Re- I mean, obviously, we were chuffed to, to have come runners up in the Premier League. Ordinarily, we'd be talking now about Champions League football, wouldn't we? Which would have been stunning. Um but we, yeah, we we felt gutted, and we felt like we needed to sort of win something or or prove something the next year, which went on to happen. Did you feel you were kind of a fully fledged first teamer? Did you still feel you were a bit fringy, or what kind of you know how involved did you feel? I mean, you were involved, and like you said, you were involved in a, a lot of you know. I don't think people counted assists back then in the same way that they do now. But you were involved in a lot of assists. How, how how much of a part of it did you feel, Froggy? A massive part of it. Um, I, I remember. I mean, it, it, big. I mean, this is a this is obviously a true story. I, I remember. I I had I had I suffered with something called Osgood Slatters because I was so young and I was playing lots and lots of football. I was still growing, and because I was, I, I had clearly I hadn't fully developed. It, that that was going to not be until I was about 23, 24 years of age before I physically started to develop. Um, but I, I had some issues with, with slatters around my shins. So I ended up having an operation on one. Anyway, I'd not trained, literally I hadn't trained for three months. And Jim Walker took me outside of the ball. Literally the first day on the Monday morning, uh, running around with the ball. Big runs come outside. He went, Froggy, are you fit? I went, I'm looking at the physio going, what do I say? I mean, what do I say? Yeah, no, but yeah, yes, boss, I'm fit. He went, right, son, you're playing tonight. It was a live Sky game against Arsenal at Villa Park. Arsenal were like one of the best teams in the country. I've not kicked a ball for three months. And he started me on, in the game. And I'm thinking, so again, you know, as a young lad, you're thinking, wow, you know, he must think a lot of me to, you know, I've not kicked a ball for three months. As it goes, I played really well for about 60 minutes and then completely nutty blew up because I couldn't run anymore. Um but yeah, so if you say feel part of it, yeah, Big Ron made me feel like I was really part of the first team squad. And and and, and a lot of the time, if I was fit, I actually did play. I can't remember at what age you were or whether you made it around the first team by the time that you um that you you met your wife. And I tell you what, you know that that American sitcom kind of how how I met your mother. Whenever I hear that title, for some reason, it just reminds me of your story of, of meeting meeting your good lady wife. Oh, I, well, yes, I was a regular first team player, and I was I was the only. Well, but you forget that first team; they were all married men. There was only me, Dwight, and Dalian at the time who were single as such. The rest of them were all married. So Big Ron said to me, "Right, Froggy, you're sitting on my table. We're going to be sat with Doug." And you're going to be a judge. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be the worst night of my life. All my mates are up there drinking, having a good fun. And I'm sat on on, on, on the table with the chairman and the gaffer having to behave myself. I'm watching all the, these girls, loads of pretty girls, doing their, doing their thing or whatever. And anyway, I, didn't, I didn't really take too much notice of it. So at the end of the night, this uh, young lady come over and went, oh, I'm just wondering, I've, I've won tonight. Thank you for voting for me. And I went, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I put you fourth. And she went, I could tell by looking in her eyes. Well, I didn't need your didn't need your vote. I won anyway, and then carried on. 
So Graham Fenton, who who was one of my muckers, who, one of my uh, going out partners, because we were similar ages, he said to me, Frog said, look, I need, I need a wingman tonight. He said, I've got a girl uh, wants to meet me in the dome, the dome of all places. Can you believe? So we, we dressed up in suits going into the dome. And he, he, he said to me, he said, look, he said, I need a wingman. He said, she, her mate's there. So anyway, we've, we've got to the dome. And I've said, OK, they're, 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 he was with this girl. And I said, oh, I said, who do you want me to try and talk to then? He, he went, her over there. I've looked over. It's the girl I've just put forth in Miss Aston Villa. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I said, I'm going to get absolutely custard pie, dear. I remember going up to her and going, I'm thinking, oh, no, she's going to just blow me out. What am I doing up here talking to you when there's sort of the, the groupy type things going on down there? And she went, well, go on then. So I went back down with my tail between my legs. Anyway, at the end of the night, she was stood there and she looked, she did look beautiful in this in this uh, ball gown. And the funny thing was, she didn't know I was a footballer even then. Even in the club, she had no idea. She was not a football fan. Her dad was a Villa fan. And the only reason she entered was to win the, the holiday to Cyprus. She thought, and you could understand why, as skinny as I was, I was a hanger on. She, she knew Graham was a footballer because her mate had told her she was meeting a footballer. She thought I was Graham's hanger on. At the end of the night, I was really bored and I wanted to go and get a curry. So I said, should we go and get a curry? So we ended up going to curry. So she thought I was going to take her to Posh Schimler Pink's. I actually took her to my favourite place, the one next door, the you know the, the Spit and Sawdust Curry House, which did the most amazing curry. So I wasn't trying to like be over, overly flash with her. So I, I, there was not a lot going for me because I, I was driving a Fiesta, and she was as well. And then at the end of the night, she dropped me off. It wasn't till the next morning when I called. I went, oh, um, shall we hook up? She went, no, can't. My dad just told me you play for Aston Villa because she told her dad her name, who was a Villa fan. And she went, it looks really bad if I'm dating. And I've only, I've only just won Miss Aston Villa. So, so but three months went by and I ended up um, doing a tour, one of the tours before the games. And she happened to be there and, and we got introduced and I pretended I didn't know her. One thing led to another. We, we got together, hooked up and whatever. And actually we're celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary this year. So it just shows you know, how, how how funny life can end up being sometimes. I, I love that story. And it brings me on, and I hope you don't mind me asking, but you share all this on social anyway. Friday night at the Froggies, you know, it's for us who don't, we, none of us get out anywhere, but we don't need to because you, you you tend to kind of, you know, share your little kind of house parties with the rest of the world every week. It looks brilliant in your house. Well, do you know, social media, so it can be such a, a place for, evil and and bitterness and and i i, I it, sometimes social media drains me i i think why can't people just be nice it, 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 are we asking too much for people to be kind and nice and and I, as i said i've lost my mum i've been through a lot the last few months with, with all this going on and, and what we're trying to do because i'm trying to look after the mental health of my kids as well i've got a 23 year old and a 21 year old who who their lives have been turned upside down like everybody else in the country and we try and say, right, we're going to have we're going to have fun. So instead of you know people, some of the things that people put on social media, we 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 have a good drink, we have a laugh, we have it. My girls love dancing, and I just take videos. I'm just sat there with a bottle of wine mostly, watching them entertain me, and then occasionally I join in with the dancing. And it, it seems to have kept quite a few people amused over the last few months. So we'll carry on doing it until lockdown's over, and hopefully we can go into a proper beer garden soon and do it properly. Genuinely, it, does, it brings a smile to my face every, every time you see it. Uh, I can't get my wife and my daughter to dance on camera, but um, probably probably a good thing anyway. We've got to that season where Villa have missed out in 92-93. We're going to come to the, the cup final eventually. I know that's a story of disappointment for you, but leading up to that, what was that season like after Villa have just missed out on the title? Did, was there the energy and the confidence to kind of go again, if you like? Actually, there was. Yeah, I mean, we we brought in extra new players. That there was a real emphasis. There was a real determination. You you forget that the players that I played with, that they weren't losers. We were talking about serial winners: Steve Staunton, Kevin Richardson, Andy Towns. You know, people like this had played at the biggest clubs were were winners. So that, that that's one lesson that was in, ingrained in me. Listen, don't feel sorry for yourselves. That's done now. We're gonna we're gonna kick on this year. And obviously, with Big Ron, there was no way you weren't gonna have want to kick on because Big Ron wanted to win stuff. He was a winner too. Um, so whilst the league campaign didn't work out as we'd have hoped, the cup, I mean, the cup final was the big thing. I mean, to, to win a, a trophy is always massive. 
um, and, and everything built up really to that. Am I right in thinking that you started the league game before the cup final and you started the league game after the cup final, yet Big Ron bombed you for the, uh, bombed you for the big showpiece occasion? I think I started all five league, league games before the cup final. I've had meals with Big Ron. I, I love Big Ron to bits, right? So, and I've had this conversation in private with him afterwards. Why? Why? What happened and how How my life, my footballing life could have changed immeasurably if different things had been put in place. So I, I was, how I remember it, I was offered a contract, which was dreadful, really dreadful. And I went... And when you're a kid that comes through the, the, the ranks, they, try, they tend to treat you really badly. That, that's just the way of the world. It's how it goes. Anyway, I fought my corner. I'm, no, I'm not signing that contract. I deserve better than that. You know, the, the players, some of the players would be signing contracts from 30, 40 times a week more than I was. So, you know, I wasn't going to settle for, for like, being, or like, like being treated like an apprentice still. So we, 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 it was to and fro, kicking back, kicking back. Anyway, Big Ron said, if you don't sign your contract, you, you won't play in the cup final. I'm thinking, oh, well, fine, okay. He won't bite his nose off to spite his face. So anyway, I mean, and he proved his genius was proved to be right because he picked the team that won the game. The issue would be is having played all league games leading up to the cup final and playing in the Chelsea game after the cup final, um, I wasn't even on the bench. I, I, I just couldn't get my head around it. And I kind of felt like he, I, I felt treated really badly. You know, especially bearing in mind that I, I came back and I played for him straight away when I, and I'd carried injuries for him and other stuff. I kind of felt, how did I not deserve to get on the bench at least? I, I just couldn't get my head around it. So I was, I was, I was delighted for the team. But in, inside, it, it, it kind of destroyed me for a good six weeks afterwards. I kind of, I, I kind of lost my way a little bit because I felt he... That that really unfair, and then to play me on the Tuesday against Chelsea at home after the cup final was like, you know, just rub my face right in it. Why don't you? Um, and I, and at the time, I outside of Tony Daly and Spinksy, I think I, I think I was probably the third longest serving player of the club. Bearing in mind, I'd been there since I was thirteen years of age. Mm. I, I was part of the furniture. Everybody in every corridor of the club knew who I was. I'd been in work with them in my apprenticeship. I worked with Lee in ticket sales. So everybody in the offices um, knew, knew who I was on a personal basis, not like footballers nowadays. You, you never get to meet anyone inside a football club. Um, so I was really good friends. So, yeah, that, that really broke my heart. And then then at the end of the city, and then as I remember it, Big, Big Ron went off to America to, to commentate uh, for America. And it was a kind of, here's your contract, lump it or leave it. And I thought, well, OK, fine. If that's how it is, great. And then you know, Graham Taylor, who I, again, adored when I was at Aston Villa, was a fantastic person. He he wanted to have talks with me. And at that time, um, I know I, I had, I'd had talks with Liverpool and two other Premier League clubs. And I decided I wanted to play for Graham because as a young boy, I kind of thought he will develop my career in a proper way. He'll look after me. He'll shield me. He'll he'll be he'll make me a better person and a better player. And then I'd heard nothing from Aston Villa. And then with about four weeks to go before me actually then signing for Wolves, Doug Ellis started chasing me all the time. He kept offering me contract after contract after contract. But at that time, I'd already given Graham my word I'd sign for him because I thought Villa. I'd, well, I didn't know what was going on, and that that's the whole that's the whole awful scenario about what happened because. When I was in, when I was in the England squad, and I, and I, and Big Ron was there. Obviously, he was commentating. He he pulled me aside and he said, "You do realise?" He said, "I had you earmarked the next year to play for for us at left back." And he said, "You'd have been England's left back at Aston Villa for ten years." He said, "I'm telling you." And I and I, and, and I, can't, I I struggled with that because I think, well, why didn't you say that at the time? Was it a l lack of communication? Was I just a young, headstrong kid who? who didn't want to be a, a, a very tiny fish in a big pond who had just got swallowed up when if anything went wrong, which is what I, I kind of felt what happened in the cup final. I could be discarded because yeah. I was a young kid. Um, and, yeah, when I look back in hindsight, and I've had several meals. I've been, out, I've been out in Tenerife with Ron and Maggie. I've had meals out with him. And we've discussed all this. And it, it, it's, it, it tinges my heart with sadness because my path at Aston Villa could have been so, so different, man.
do you think it was like brinksmanship then that they thought they could get away with it and they didn't realise until it was too late it was it was irretrievable? Or... Yeah, well, I think, yeah, because I say but, but, um, Doug Ellis was begging my dad for me to stay. So, and my dad went, well, he's already given his word to Graham. We can't, and, and actually, as it, as it happened, I was offered exactly the same deal by by Doug as what I was offered by Graham at Wolf. So, um, it, it then it was not a money thing. It then became a, a thing of honour. I couldn't I couldn't ring up Graham up then and go, sorry, I've given you my word. I'll go back on it. I'm, I'm an honourable person. I just couldn't do that. Um, you know, and, you know, I've got no regrets in in that way because I went on to have you know great time at the two clubs I went and played. Anyway, you, you can't have any regrets about what happened. But my time at Aston Villa. I, I could have I could have spent my entire career there quite easily. So given given how Ron has kind of built you up to be kind of ten foot tall, the way you, you know you come back from injury after three months and he, he's got you straight on the pitch in, in a big game, did he? And I'm not listen. I'm not asking you to dig out Ron. Ron Ron's brilliant. And we've had Ron on for a chat, and he's, he's great value as you know. But did it surprise you that his man management let him down then? Or well, we've had I've had this discussion with him. Um, and, and he, he sees it slightly differently to me because he was obviously the experienced manager, wasn't he? I mean, in, in terms of the cup final, he, he would say, well, my team won, I won. I, I've got no argument with that. The, the starting lineup, no argument. It, it was Ron genius, what he did. Put five in the middle, brutal genius. But it was the, the not, I, I didn't even get a medal, Matt. And that, that's what really killed me because I've been at the club for such a long time. I played all the league games, leading up to all, every, uh, all the things that I'd done. And I didn't get a medal. And that, I broke my heart. It, honestly, it really broke my heart. And the first team, and, and Rico and Spinkster, they all knew it broke my heart. They could see it in me for a few weeks afterwards. I couldn't get it. I, I really struggled with it for a while. Um, and, you know, I think maybe Big Ron was so preoccupied with going to America to, to maybe look at other players in the World Cup. He was commentating, I think, for ITV, wasn't he? He probably had a lot on his plate and probably I was maybe the last thing on his mind in a squad of 40-odd people. I, I really don't know what, what 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 his thinking was and why it wasn't, but it, it, it was yeah. I, I kind of, I felt let down. It, and when people say to me, "Did Villa get rid of you?" No, <laughs> they wanted to sign me, but it just how it never happened. Uh, it, it's, I scratch my head to this day why why they never got a deal sorted. And I, and I and I played at the end of the day. I was I was only twenty one years of age, Matt. I had the whole of my career ahead of me. I look at the young kids at Villa now and go, you know, I, I look at, I, I really look at Jack's development in re, with real interest because he got in the team. I'm, different levels of team. I got into a team that was top Premier League. Jack got into a team that wasn't so much with, with Paul Lambert in the beginning and how it came through. And I've watched how Jack's developed physically, mentally, into a world class superstar for me now. One of the one of the yeah. finest footballers I've seen for a long time. Into he, he's the closest I think we've got to Gaza, and, and and I was played in an era with Gaza. He's still got a way to go to get to that level. Don't yeah. get me wrong; he's got more to prove. But he's more is as more Ga Gaza I can remember. And I think, wow, if I'd have stayed at Villa Join, how would I have developed with all those quality players? Yeah. How how good could I have got? Because I say I was nine stone wet through. I played in an era where fullbacks got four free chops in half before they even got a yellow card. So I, as a young, skinny young lad, I got no protection whatsoever. And I, I, I do always think how my career would have developed having stayed, you know, Villa in the Premier League during that time. Fascinated when footballers leave clubs. You've got a normal job now in the normal world. I mean, normal world pre the, the, the past year, you'd have leaving parties or you'd go for a round of drinks with you with your mates as you moved on to your next office or whatever it was. What's it like when you when you leave a football club? Do you just clear your locker at, at Bodymore and then off you go? Or? Yeah. I mean, for me, it wasn't... I mean, the, the move wasn't too difficult because I was moving to a club where Paul Birch was there. Tony Daly had just signed. Well, Tony Daly was the best man at my wedding. Birch, he was one of my best friends. Uh, Gordon Cowans came and joined us. Graham Taylor was there with Steve Harrison, who... You know, and Dennis Booth, who were coaches in my younger days at Villa. So I, actually, I felt like I was moving from one home straight to another. It, it didn't seem like a, it was like a, a, a big transition, in all honesty. So in terms of saying farewells, though, you were saying earlier kind of how you're part of the furniture. You knew all the office staff. You, you knew Lee Priest and the people behind the scenes. I suppose we're talking when mobile phones aren't really, aren't a thing. So is it just the kind of, ta see you later? Yeah. 
Well, if, if I said to you 30 years later, I mean, obviously, you know, I did, I've done the, the, the media stuff for a long time. If I said to you 30 years later, I could still go into the offices of Villa Park and people would still come and give me a hug. When I was an apprentice with Graham Taylor, Graham Taylor had this family thing. It's, it, the, 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 the tea lady is as important as his top superstar. And he instilled that with everyone in the club. You're not bigger and better than anyone else's football club. You treat everybody with respect. And he made all his apprentices. We used to do work experience with one of the officers with the, with the club shop and then the ticket office. So we used to do a, a, a you know a day of work in each of these places. And I became really good friends with virtually everybody throughout the club. And there's still a lot of people at the football club, even to this day from when I was there, that 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 I know really well. And it, again, it it's just one big big enormous family and I don't I think that's something footballers are going to miss out in the future by the way because I know they don't have that level of closeness now they don't have anything to do with people in the offices but in our day yeah we, we were really friendly and have, they've always been like family to me ever since it sounds like you've got lots of best mates at Villa back in the day but mentioned Tony Daly being your best man would he be the one the one the kind of your most enduring best mate from Villa back then yeah yeah because he was my he was my role model um he he was amazing. Some senior players, if you got a, a young kid upstart trying to nick your place or be part, you know, I mean, Tony could play either side, so it wasn't really an issue. And also, I was I could have played left back or or any any part in the pitch. Um, and Tony, um, he was so supportive, unbelievably supportive. You know, brilliant, brilliant guy. One of the nicest men you'd ever wish to meet. Tony is, um, and. And, and and I remember I actually remember this one day we've we've played Swindon it's nil nil at half time and Ron's given us pelters at half time anyway we, we thrashed Swindon five nil in the second half and this is something you probably wouldn't think you've ever heard daily cross frog at diving header <laughs> and that's what happened Dale Dale's crossed the ball I a big man diving header on the back post little whippersnapper in the back post me, me, me that's another one me and Dale's died on all the time quiz question. <laughs> Yeah, because when, when we were at Wolves, we never played together because he it, it had the most horrendous injuries. But t- Tony was Tony was frightening. I mean, he's quick and but as a, as a mentor, as someone in my position, he was he was yeah, he was just the best. I'm a journalist who leaves no stone unturned, so I've checked Wikipedia, and I've <laughs> so I think when you when you hung up your boots uh, with that career ending injury when you were at Coventry, I think it, it lists you as press officer fitness instructor, media pundit, and I know from having caught up with you in recent years, mortgage advisor, are you still kind of in that in that game at the moment, Froggy? Yeah, I've been doing that for quite a few years now. I, 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 I kind of did all these jobs working alongside as a, a media pundit. I mean, I worked for BBC Radio for over 20 years. I, I only sort of packed it in a couple of years ago because I, I couldn't maintain a full-time job and media duties over weekends. It was it was killing me. And I, I, and sometimes you, you think, okay, I've had enough of my own voice now. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna disappear into the sunset a little bit now and and hide away. Um so yeah losing my career at 26 way before I should have lost my career was so brutal and so tough. And and like you hear players struggle. I can see why players struggle mentally when they leave the game. I was like the fact like that character on the fast show. This week I shall be mostly being and that, I used to come up with a, a job <laughs> because that's how many how many jobs I kind of got through in that sort of six, seven year period. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought, I'll give that one a go. If, if that works out, I might stick with that. And that's kind of what happened until eventually, you know, one or two stuck. And I start, you know, I, I enjoy the job I do now. You know, you, you, you played in the Premier League when it blew up. It became this real kind of global phenomenon. What's it like now when you're saying to you're picking up a call, a customer, a call from a customer and they recognise the name because you've got a distinctive name? How, how does that play out? I have some amusing moments because you can't, once they hear you talking, I think I reckon, because obviously work, being on the radio, people do recognise your voice as well. Um, and, and I go, and they, they always, are you, are you uh, do you know? And I go, yeah, it's, that's me. Yeah, yeah. And I try and, I try and forget, skirt it away as quickly as possible because I think, you know, that was then. It was yesteryear. This is my job now. Yeah. What, 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 what do you want me to do for you? <laughs> I mean, it's lovely. I mean, to, to still be recognised all these years later from, from like football fans is, is is really sweet. And you know, it is it's a great honour, especially you know because I played for three clubs in the Midlands as well. Um, but it is, yeah. I mean, it doesn't cause many problems in my job. It, it, it's actually more fun, and we, I do have some fun conversations with people. I know you're not doing the, the gig when you're in commentary boxes. Um any longer but do you still get to games occasionally or do you do you stick it on the telly every weekend oh, my, or? my son's a villa fan 
Matt, and he's got Froggy on the back of his shirt. So if you ever see him at Villa Park, he's probably the only person at Villa Park left who's got Froggy on, on the back of his shirt. But yeah, he, he oh, actually, actually he's mad for it. He absolutely loves the Villa. Uh, and I don't, that was that was one of the reasons why I quit the media because I felt guilty because I, I think you know, life passes you by so quickly and I don't get a chance to spend time with my son anyway as it is. Uh, and, and he wants me to go to Villa Park with him more often because yeah, obviously he, it's a father-son thing, isn't it? Um, and yeah, so I, hopefully when we get out of this lockdown, I'll be able to do a, a, an awful lot, lot more of that with him. Is that in the posh seats? Do you slum it occasionally? A bit of both? Do you know what? Do you know what my dream? I'd, I'd love to go a bit incognito into the whole tent. I'd love, having played in front of it, and my dad's ashes being there as well, I'd love to go and sneak in there one. I know I know Tails has done it a few times. Um, I'd love to go in there, you know, and, and just just to soak up the atmosphere. I'd look, in fact, I will do that, and I will do it, but I won't tell anybody when I'm doing it, of course. You have to do that. No. So if you see somebody with a baseball cap on, dark glasses, standing next <laughs> to somebody with froggy on the back of the shirt, which might blow your cover. No, I'll make, you know, I won't let him wear that shirt because it'd be so obvious, won't it? There's some old, old, old funny duddy with him next to him. I, 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 one story I, I will say as well, in terms of um, when I was retiring as well, this, this is a classic. Let's just say my daughter, my son and my wife are on the attractive side of life and, and I, I, I sit sort of on the other side a wee bit. So... This when, when I retired, my missus said to me, uh, "You've been asked to do a modelling job," and I'm thinking, "Airfix, uh, okay, fine." And then she said, "I said, is it Balaclavas?" And she said, "No, no, no." She said, we, "We've got a um, a job with uh, Land Rover. They're doing a, a Born Free campaign, and and you've just got to do, go there and pretend you know, rah and whatever, and that's it." Anyway, so it's it's a uh, Land Rover in Coventry. So bear in mind, I've just left Coventry. The place is full of Coventry City fans working. So when we got there, they've gone, right, make up. I'm looking at my missus going, you what? Make up. They only, they only painted us as lions. Right. So I'm not, I'm now, I'm now not happy. I, I thought I was, I thought it was an easy gig and a couple of quid could t- hide behind the good looking ones and I can sort of walk away, get me money. So the photographer's there, and we're all my two little ones at the time painted. They're, they're loving it. They're getting it. So he's going after three, rah, and I'm going. Rrr. And my missus, you could just say that you could show a bit more enthusiasm. I went, you're kidding me, aren't you? So anyway, got that done. I can hear the sniggers in the background from what I'm doing. I've got in my car. I'm fuming now because I was going on to another gig. So I, I didn't even wash the, the the lion stuff off my face. So I'm, I'm piling down the motorway and I've gone through two speed cameras because I'm, I'm just oblivious to what's going on. Uh, and I've got done. So about a month, two months later, I've got a speed thing coming through. I'm thinking, I can't remember when that would be. So I said, I said, I said look, because also I, I was on about nine points. I thought, oh, I'm going to get done here. So I said to her, I says, were you, was, were, you, were you driving my car that day? She says, I don't know. I said, look, I, I don't want to say you were and you weren't. I said, we'll, we'll go and ask for the official photographs. <laughs> but two weeks later, photos come on. Big head of a lion. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, had, I had to go to court because it took me above the allotted time. I can, I can hear the, I just, the, the, the giggles from the people looking at the photos about... <laughs> <laughs> me dressed as a lion, painted as a lion. I think they felt so so sorry for me, thinking, "Oh, life must have been so tough for this lad. If, if, if he was a professional footballer, he's got to do this for a living now. We, we'll just let him off." <laughs> and oh, they give me a suspended. I got a suspended ban. Oh dear. So that oh. was, and, and, and one final one as well. And this this involves Andy Blair, you know, ex Villa Andy Blair. Yeah. So another one of these daft jobs I got conned by my missus into doing was to do workwear. So we're down in Tilbury Docks in Essex and I'm, I'm dressed like Bob the Builder, let's say. And that's being kind. And um, I thought, no one's ever going to see this picture ever. <laughs> so I'm, a- I'm actually in the Villa Park press room <laughs> before commentating on a game. And Blair has walked in and gone, is this you? <laughs> now, can you picture it? How was I to know Andy Blair had a workwear workwear business and he had one of the only copies of this, <laughs> this thing you've ever seen to which he passed it all around i'm sat there going oh my god there was like five pictures of me wearing dungarees and stuff so yeah that was the end of and not that was ever going to get anywhere anyway but that was the end of a very bad modeling career oh that's brilliant i've got i've, I've got a perfect perfect disguise you know to get you in the hole and you can either go in as hercules the mascot as a lion 
or just to, just to kind of you know an incognito construction worker can't you do it like that and just <laughs> just sneak sneak unnoticed and experience the whole tending in full flow. Um, listen, Froggy, that's been an absolute delight. The story after story after story, it's brilliant. And like you said, every, every setback. You, listen, you, you've you've lived the dream. You've done what all of us would love to do, and you you've played for that great football club that's Aston Villa, and you've you, you know had a brilliant career. Um, but the way that you've coped with all the setbacks that, that life's thrown at you and come come out the other side smiling is is a, is a tribute to you as well. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and until next time you've been watching Claret and Blue with me Matt Kendrick the legend that's Steve Froggett up the villa thank you for listening to Claret and Blue an Aston Villa podcast if you enjoyed today's episode then please do let us know we love hearing your feedback we'll be back soon with another episode but until then up the villa up the villa